bent down and put my eye to the keyhole. I felt very sick and afraid. The bright moonlight was shining into the room. I could clearly see a face. This face was looking straight at me. It did not move. There was a horrible smile on the face. This is terrible, I said to Holmes. What shall we do? We must break down the door, he replied. We threw ourselves at the door and it broke with a sudden crack. We were inside Bartholomew Sholto's room. Bartholomew Sholto was dead. He was sitting in a chair by a table. His body was stiff and cold. I could see that he had been dead for many hours. The dead man's body was twisted with pain. There was a horrible smile on his face. There was a piece of paper on the body. Holmes picked it up and read it. Look, he said. In the light of the lamp I read with horror, The Sign of Four. What does it mean? I asked. It means murder, Holmes replied. He pointed to Bartholomew Sholto's ear. Look. I looked. I saw something sticking in the dead man's skin near his ear. It looks like a thorn, I said. It is a thorn, said Holmes. You can take it out, but be careful. It is poisoned. I took the thorn between my finger and thumb. I pulled it away easily from the dead man's skin. I looked at it. It was hard and sharp. I saw that it had poison on it. So, this is how Bartholomew Sholto died, I said. What a terrible death! But who killed him, and why? We had forgotten about Thaddeus Sholto. He was still standing in the doorway. Suddenly he gave a cry. The treasure has gone, he said. They've stolen the treasure. Look, do you see that hole in the ceiling? We lowered the treasure down through that hole the last night. After I had helped my brother with the treasure, I left him here in this room. I was the last person to see my brother alive. I heard him lock the door as I came downstairs. What time was that? asked Holmes. It was ten o'clock, and now my brother Bartholomew is dead, and the great Agra treasure has gone. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Go to the police station, Mr. Sholto, said Holmes. Ask the police to come quickly. Dr. Watson and I will wait here. Thaddeus Sholto turned away. We heard him going downstairs. Now, Watson, said Holmes, we have some work to do before the police arrive. We must find out how the murderer got into the room. The door was locked, but what about the window? He carried the lamp to the window and examined the window sill carefully. Look, he said, someone has come in by the window. Here is the print of a foot on the window sill, and here is a round mark. And look, on the floor. Here is another footprint and another mark. And again by the table. See, here, Watson. I looked at the marks. Some were footprints, but some were in the shape of small circles. Those are not footprints, I said. No, replied Holmes. They are the marks made by someone with a wooden leg. Someone with a wooden leg, I said. Holmes, Thaddeus Sholto told us that his father was afraid of a man with a wooden leg. Yes, said Holmes, but the wooden-legged man was not alone. Someone else has been here too. Look outside. We both went to the window and looked down. We are very high up, said Holmes. A man with a wooden leg would not be able to climb here by himself. Two people came into this room. We will call them number one and number two. Number two is the wooden-legged man. But who is number one, and how did he get in? I looked round the room. I thought quickly. Then suddenly I knew the answer. 
In the ceiling of the room was a hole. Thaddeus Sholto had told us that his brother had made this hole. The Agra treasure had been hidden in the secret room above. The two Sholto brothers had lowered the treasure chest through this hole the night before. A set of steps was standing beneath the hole. On the floor by the set of steps was a rope. Number one must have looked through the hole in the ceiling, I said. He saw Bartholomew Sholto sitting on the chair below him. He killed Sholto with a poisoned thorn. Then he must have taken the rope, opened the window, and thrown the end of the rope down into the garden. His friend, number two, the wooden-legged man, must have been waiting below. Number two climbed up the rope with the help of number one. The murderers then lowered the treasure chest to the ground with the rope. Number two climbed down the rope. Number one got out of the room through the hole in the ceiling. Excellent, Watson, said Holmes. We shall now go up and have a look at the secret room. Perhaps we can find out more information about number one. We climbed the steps and found ourselves in a small dark room without any windows. There was thick dust on the floor. It was here that the treasure had been hidden for so many years. Look, said Holmes, there is a small door in the roof. That is how number one got in. Then Holmes shone the lamp down at the floor. By the light of the lamp I saw that the floor was covered with many footprints. They showed very clearly in the thick dust. They were the prints of bare feet. But they were not the footprints of an ordinary man. They were extremely small. Suddenly, a horrible thought came into my mind. Holmes, I whispered, a child has done this terrible thing. Holmes did not answer. He was still studying the tiny footprints. Finally, he spoke. No, he said slowly. I don't think it was a child. Look at this footprint. Look at the marks of the toes. They are very wide apart. It is not a child's footprint. It is a man's. They are the prints of a tiny man. Do you mean a dwarf? I asked in surprise. I will show you, replied Holmes. Let's go into the room again. Let's examine once more the poisoned thorn which killed Bartholomew Sholto. In the room below, I picked up the thorn. I held it carefully between my fingers. I felt afraid. It was long and sharp. Now then, said Holmes, what do you think about this thorn? Is it an English thorn? No, I said. It certainly is not. You see, said Holmes, already we begin to know many things about murderer number one. He is a very small man, in other words, a pygmy, from some foreign land. He is very strong and can climb great heights easily. He is also extremely dangerous. He kills people by shooting them with poisoned thorns. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. I looked at Holmes in astonishment. How strange, I said. Why are a pygmy and a wooden-legged man working together? Who are these people, Holmes, and why did they kill Bartholomew Sholto? They wanted the treasure, of course, answered Holmes. Last night, Bartholomew Sholto was sitting in this room with the treasure. The pygmy came in through the roof and saw him. The only way to get the treasure was to kill Sholto. And what about the paper with the sign of four? I asked. It must mean revenge, Holmes answered. Remember that a paper from the sign of four was also found on the dead body of Major Sholto. I don't know why someone wants revenge on the Sholto family, but we know that someone wanted revenge. They also wanted the treasure, and they were prepared to kill the Sholtos, father and son, to get the treasure. Holmes took out his magnifying glass and started to examine the room again. There were some bottles and tubes in one corner of the room, 
Bartholomew Sholto must have been interested in chemistry. A glass tube had broken, and a dark liquid had spilled onto the floor. Holmes gave a loud cry of joy. Come here, Watson, he said. What can you smell? I walked over. Suddenly, I smelled something very strong and unpleasant. The smell was coming from the dark liquid on the floor. It smells like tar, I said. It is similar to tar. Holmes answered. It is creosote. He was smiling and rubbing his hands together. Why are you so pleased? I asked. Holmes pointed to the floor. I saw a clearly marked small footprint. I realized that the pygmy had stepped in the creosote. I know a dog which loves the smell of creosote. It will follow this smell for miles and miles, said Holmes. We'll catch these murderers now. Just then, we heard footsteps and loud voices outside the room. It's the police, said Holmes. As he spoke, a fat man in a grey suit entered the room. His face was red and his eyes were small and bright. He was followed by a policeman in uniform and by Thaddeus Sholto. I'd never seen the fat man before, but Holmes seemed to know him well. Good evening, Inspector Jones, said Holmes politely. Don't you remember me? The fat man stopped and stared. He was not very pleased to see Holmes. Why, yes, of course, he said. You are Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the private detective. Yes, I remember you well. This is an interesting crime, Mr. Holmes. A man has been murdered, and jewels worth a million pounds are missing. What do you think happened? Well, began Holmes, but Inspector Jones did not want to listen to my friend. He thought his own ideas were better. Listen, Mr. Holmes, I will tell you what I think, he said importantly. This man... Thaddeus Sholto tells me that he was with his brother last night. They discovered the treasure together. He was the last person to see his brother alive. Now, I think that Thaddeus Sholto killed his brother. Then he ran off with the jewels. Oh, no, it isn't true, cried Thaddeus Sholto. What about the poisoned thorn in the dead man's skin? asked Holmes. And the paper with the sign of four. The thorn belongs to Thaddeus Sholto, replied Jones quickly. I don't think the paper is very important. Perhaps it's a trick. But wait a moment. What's that up there? I see a hole in the ceiling. I must have a look. Inspector Jones went quickly up the steps. We heard him moving about noisily in the room above. Then he came down again. He was hot and dusty. I know everything now, he cried. I have found a door which leads out onto the roof. That was how Thaddeus Sholto escaped. But the footprints, began Holmes. Inspector Jones was not listening. He had not noticed the tiny footprints. He turned to Thaddeus Sholto. The poor man was shaking with fear. Mr. Sholto? said Jones. I arrest you for the murder of your brother. I didn't do it, Thaddeus cried. Please, Mr. Holmes, believe me. Don't worry, Mr. Sholto, said Holmes. I know that you didn't kill your brother. I will find the murderer. Inspector Jones turned to Holmes angrily. Listen, Mr. Holmes, he said. This is a matter for the police. It has nothing to do with you. Good night, gentlemen. Inspector Jones and the policeman took Thaddeus Sholto away. A few minutes later, the house was quiet again. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. The police don't want my help, Watson, 
said Holmes, as soon as the inspector had gone. Inspector Jones thinks he has solved the crime and caught the murderer, but they have arrested the wrong man. I agreed with Holmes. I was sure that Thaddeus Sholto was not the murderer. We must be quick, Watson, said Holmes. I want you to do two things. First, take Miss Morstan home. Second, go to this address. Three Pinchin Lane. Ask for Mr. Sherman. He has an old dog called Toby. I want you to bring Toby here. Meet me here in two hours' time. I took Miss Morstan home in Thaddeus Sholto's cab. She was very upset by what had happened and spoke very little. I promised that I would visit her the next day. Then I went to the address which Holmes had given me. It was the middle of the night, and the streets of London were black and silent. As the cab went along, I thought about everything that had happened. We had discovered the truth about some things. The death of Captain Morstan. The sending of the pearls to Miss Morstan. The advertisement. The letter. All these things were clear. Now there were other mysteries which we had to solve. Where was the Indian treasure? What was the plan found in Morstan's luggage? Who wanted Bartholomew Sholto to die? Where were the pygmy and the wooden-legged man? What did all these things mean? And what was the mysterious sign of four? I hoped that Sherlock Holmes would discover the answer to these questions. Soon I arrived in Pinchin Lane, the address where Holmes had sent me. It was a very poor street and the houses were old and dirty. I found house number three and knocked on the door. After some time, a face looked out from a window above. It was not a friendly face. Who are you? said the face angrily. What do you want? Uh, come down and open the door, I said. I have something to ask you. Go away at once, said the face. If you don't, I'll let out fifty dogs upon you. My friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I began. At these words, the window suddenly shut, and a few minutes later, the door opened. I saw an old man with grey hair and beard holding a candle in his hand. Come in, sir, he said. I'm Mr. Sherman. I'm sorry that I was rude. I didn't know that you were a friend of Sherlock Holmes. I went into the small, dirty house and stopped in astonishment. There were cages everywhere I looked. All the cages contained different kinds of animals. I could see their eyes shining in the candlelight. What does Mr. Holmes want? asked the old man. A dog called Toby, I answered. Toby is my best dog said Mr. Sherman. He loves to follow strong smells, especially the smell of creosote. That's his favourite. That's why Mr. Holmes wants him, I said. Wait here. I'll go and get him. The old man came back after a few minutes. He was pulling a dog on a lead. The dog looked very strange. It had very long ears and very short legs, and its eyes were large and sad. This is Toby, said Mr. Sherman. He'll go with you. He's a friendly dog. The dog licked my hand and wagged its tail. I put some money into Mr. Sherman's hand, and the old man gave me Toby's lead. When I got back to Pondicherry Lodge, I found Sherlock Holmes standing outside the door. He was smoking his pipe. Excellent, Watson, he cried when he saw me. You've done well. Good dog, Toby. Come here. Good dog. Holmes took a handkerchief out of his pocket and gave it to Toby to smell. The handkerchief was covered with creosote. The dog went mad with excitement. His sad eyes shone with happiness and his tail wagged. See how he loves the smell, said Holmes. We won't have any problems now. Holmes pointed at a drain pipe, which went down from the roof of the house. While you were away, Watson, he said, I went up onto the roof and discovered how the pygmy climbed up. 
and climb down again. He used that drain pipe. The drain pipe ran all the way down from the roof to the garden below. There was a large barrel full of water under the end of the drain pipe. He climbed down that drain pipe and on to the barrel beneath, said Holmes. It was very easy to follow his trail. He left marks everywhere. He also dropped this. Holmes put his hand in his pocket and took out a small bag made of dried grass. I looked inside. To my horror, I saw five or six long, dark thorns. They were the same as the one which killed Bartholomew Sholto. The murderer has lost these, said Holmes. Let's hope that he doesn't have any more. Don't touch them, Watson. They are poisoned. But come, where's Toby? We must begin. Holmes took Toby's lead and pulled the dog to the bottom of the water barrel. Toby smelled all round carefully. Suddenly, he began to bark excitedly. He had found his favourite smell, the smell of creosote. Then he started to pull at his lead. He's on the trail, cried Holmes. Let's go! The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Toby pulled at his lead and ran quickly through the grass. He ran so quickly that it was difficult to follow him. The sky was beginning to get light now. Toby ran along the paths in the garden under the trees and bushes. Then he reached the garden wall and ran along beside it. Finally, he stopped at a place in the wall where the bricks were loose. This is the place where they got into the garden, said Holmes. It is easy to climb up and down here. Look, do you see this mark? It is the print of a man's hand. He pointed at a flat stone. I saw a dirty hand print on the stone. Holmes picked up the dog and climbed over the wall. I followed. Toby soon found the trail again. Toby did not look to the right or the left. He ran straight ahead with his nose to the ground. He loved the smell of creosote. Nothing could stop him from following it. As we hurried along, I thought about the wooden-legged man and the pygmy. I wondered what would happen when we found them. I knew that they were dangerous. I wished that I had brought my gun with me. Toby was still following the trail. Now we were passing through small, narrow streets. The people were just beginning to wake up. The men were going on their way to work. The women were opening their windows and cleaning their houses. Suddenly, Toby ran down a path. This path led straight down towards the River Thames. Soon the river appeared in front of us. Toby ran faster and faster. The path went down to the water's edge. It ended at a small wooden jetty. Toby stopped. He ran backwards and forwards trying to find the smell. He looked up at us sadly with his large eyes. He did not know what to do. They've got into a boat here, said Holmes. There was a small house beside the jetty. A notice was hanging from one of the windows. On it was written in large letters, Mordecai Smith, Boats and Steam Launch for Hire. There was no one on the jetty. Several small boats were near the jetty on the bank of the river. Holmes looked at these boats. I wonder where the steam launch is, he said. I think we must ask a few questions. He knocked loudly at the door of the house. A large woman with a red face opened it. A child was crying somewhere inside the house. I saw that the woman was very upset about something. She had been crying. Good morning, said Holmes politely. Are you Mordecai Smith's wife? Yes, replied the woman. What do you want? Could I speak to your husband, please? asked Holmes. No, you can't. He isn't here. I haven't seen him since yesterday morning. Oh, said Holmes. I wanted to hire a boat. Well, perhaps I can help you, said Mrs. Smith. Which boat do you want? I wanted to hire the steam launch. I have heard it is a very good boat. Uh, let me see, what's the name? The... 
the aurora, sir, said Mrs. Smith. Oh, yes, that's right. I remember now. But where is the aurora? said Holmes, looking around. I don't see a steam launch anywhere. Oh, sir, my husband has gone in the aurora, Mrs. Smith replied, and burst into tears. I'm very worried about him. I don't trust that wooden legged man. What wooden legged man, Mrs. Smith? asked Holmes in a surprised voice. I don't know who he is, sir, but my husband went with a wooden legged man in the Aurora yesterday morning and hasn't come back. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. I'm very sorry to hear that, Mrs. Smith, said Holmes. Tell me, was this wooden legged man alone? I don't know, sir. I didn't see anyone else. But it was very dark. It was three o'clock in the morning. I could not be sure. What does the aurora look like? asked Holmes. The aurora is black, sir, with two red stripes down each side. It has a black funnel with a white stripe. The aurora is the fastest boat on the river, answered Mrs. Smith. Holmes looked worried. That's very interesting, he said. Try not to worry about your husband, Mrs. Smith. I am going up the river myself. If I see Mr. Smith, I will tell him that I have seen you. Goodbye. Goodbye, and thank you, said Mordecai Smith's wife. She had stopped crying. She went inside her house and closed the door. Watson, we must find Mordecai Smith and the Aurora as soon as possible, said Holmes. Mordecai Smith and the wooden-legged man are working together. Smith has taken the two murderers in his steam launch. They are all hiding somewhere on the river. It will be easy to find them, I said. You must tell the police at once. Holmes shook his head. No, I don't want these criminals to know that anyone is looking for them. They will try to escape again. I have a better idea, Holmes went on. I have many agents everywhere up and down the river. These agents are clever. I pay them to bring me information. They always know what is happening on the river. I will ask my agents to look for Mordecai Smith and the Aurora. But you look tired, Watson. Let's go home and have breakfast. It was now nearly eight o'clock in the morning. I did feel very tired. I was glad to go home to Baker Street. When I had a bath and changed my clothes, I came downstairs to breakfast. Holmes was drinking coffee and reading a newspaper. Look, Watson, he said. Here is a report about the murder of Bartholomew Sholto at Pondicherry Lodge and about the arrest of Thaddeus Sholto by Inspector Jones last night. I took the paper and read the report. I felt sorry for Thaddeus Sholto. Inspector Jones had made a stupid mistake by arresting him. I knew that Sholto was not guilty of the murder of his brother. I hoped that we would be able to help Thaddeus. But would we be able to find the murderers? Suddenly, there was a loud knock on the door. A few minutes later, twelve children ran into the room. Their clothes were dirty and ragged. They had no shoes on their feet. Their hair was untidy, and their faces had not been washed for a very long time. But they seemed happy and cheerful. Good morning, Mr. Holmes, said the children together. Who are these children, Holmes? I asked in astonishment. Holmes laughed. <laughs> these are my agents, he said. I sent a message for them to come. Look at them. They can go anywhere, see everything, hear everything. Nobody is afraid of children. Holmes gave each of the children some money. Then he told them what he wanted them to do. You must find a steam launch called the Aurora, he said. It is on the river somewhere and belongs to Mordecai Smith. The Aurora is black with two red stripes down each side. It has a black funnel with a white stripe. You must find it. Now go. 
the children ran out of the room, all talking together. They went down the stairs and out into the street. My agents will find Mordecai Smith and the Aurora, said Holmes. Now we 